Well, it's Friday morning. I should have recorded this on Monday morning. And somehow, somehow time is doing some very weird things. Day by day, it's like running through treacle. Everything is just dragging. And yet at exactly the same time, I blink and five days have passed. Honestly, this lockdown is playing with my head. I'm Paul. And this, well, is a slightly delayed Mastering Portrait Photography podcast. Hello all, I hope you're well. Um, <laughs> seriously, I mean, there's, there's no real schedule to the podcast, but I genuinely sat down Uh, at the beginning of the week and thought that I would publish one on Monday. And here I am, it's Friday. I'm sitting here with a cup of coffee. Uh, For once, the sun is shining through the windows. We have a little bit of nice weather around us, which is just beautiful. Uh, The coffee tastes great. Uh, Slightly hurt my ribs. I don't know what I've done. So forgive me if I sound a little bit breathy in this podcast. Every time I breathe in, it properly hurts. Uh, I don't know whether I've jabbed it. I don't know whether I've pulled something. Of course, if I go online, every single article suggests that uh, the end is nigh. So I'm trying really hard not to do too much self-diagnosis and just dosing up on uh, paracetamol uh, and hoping that the pain will eventually go. If it doesn't, then, of course, I will head off down to someone who actually knows what they're talking about. Uh, Yesterday, I did a little bit of diary, just because there is still stuff going on. I had a wedding pitch last night, which was nice. I haven't had a wedding pitch in ages, because basically all of this year's weddings are the weddings that I'd already won last year and have moved to this year. So we haven't had to do too many uh, wedding pitches, but it was an absolute delight uh, to sit, uh, admittedly, over Zoom, my I don't I don't like Zoom, I'll be honest. For those of you who uh, know me, you'll know, well, I'm a little bit of a talker. To be honest, just give me a budgie mirror. Uh, essentially, a podcast is me with a budgie mirror just talking to myself. So you know I can chat a little bit, and I find Zoom really hard, simply because the little yellow box, if somebody's dog barks, the box moves, and everyone looks at each other blank because all we can hear is a dog barking. You can see people's mouths moving and all of that kind of thing. And that's the, that's the psychology of Zoom. Whoever's got the yellow box, whoever's making the most noise wins, basically. Um, and I find it really stressful. Don't enjoy it at all. Though last night, it was lovely to talk uh, to a couple about their wedding for 2022. Uh, the bride-to-be in particular uh, was really, really excited. So it was just nice. It was just nice to be talking to someone who is energetic and excited about what's coming. I think all too often the echo chamber that as photographers we're living in just now has a propensity for being just a little bit gloomy, given most of us are certainly not shooting at the frequency we're used to if we're shooting uh, at all. So that was really nice. Uh, What else have I done this week? Oh, well, you can tell things have been quiet because uh, I took a touch typing test, a touch typing test. (laughs) <laughs> things must have been I must have been at a loose end uh, when I was at university uh, to help fund my way through um, pretty much all of us got a job of one form or another and one of the agencies that we applied to to get some temp work said can you type and it never really occurred to me that that was a skill so I went and I learnt to touch type and back then I could reach 80 words a minute as my uh, average rate, which is is pretty good. Um, And then, of course, what happened then through university and into my PhD is I can batter out an article in no time at all. If you can touch type, it's amazing how fast you can get things done. I actually think now in schools that's what they should be teaching. Everyone needs to be able to write. I'm not saying ditch reading and writing at all. Uh, You need to be able to write with a pen because that's the tool that you will always have at your fingertips. But I also think people should learn to touch type because if you can knock out 80 words a minute or actually mine has slowed down now. I'm at 63 words a minute. That was the outcome of the touch typing test. Uh, it's still, that's, I think that's about average for secretarial work if I if I had to do it. Uh, but it still means that, for instance, uh, this afternoon I've got to write an article for Professional Photo Magazine. It's about 1,700 words. Uh, It'll take me a few hours mostly to get my thoughts together, but the actual typing part of it doesn't take me very long at all. So (laughs) there you go. There you go. That made me 
it kept me entertained. Uh, so, yeah, 63 words a minute for those of you who are curious. Uh, new image critiques are starting to get my way through the backlog. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the Z7 because uh, that's what we're now using to video them. And life has just become a little bit easier because of some new kit. Um, so I'm working my way through those, forcing myself, forcing myself to get on top of the Mastering Portrait Photography website. Uh, the new logo and brand seems to have gone down pretty well, which makes me very, very happy. Thank you for those of you who've written to let me know. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, did have, uh, you know, so the two new, the two, there are two image critiques up uh, and I'm about to do another one. So uh, 27 and 28 are up uh, and uh, hopefully today I'll record 29. Um, appeared on the Photographer Academy. Uh, I don't know what you call it. It's a, a brilliant site full of resources for photographers of all types. Unlike Mastering Portrait Photography, which is purely dedicated to photographing faces Admittedly, I've snuck dogs in there, but it's purely dedicated to photographing faces. Uh, the Photographer Academy, which I think was set up by Mark Leghorn um, and a team down in South Wales. Very, very well worth going and having a look, simply because they're really lovely people down there. Um, amazing resource. Uh, some of it you pay for, some of it's available for free. But go and have a look. That's the Photographer Academy. I'll put links to all of these little bits and pieces uh, in the show notes if you'd like to jump across. Anyway, I appeared on there, did a, a one-hour um, seminar. Actually, it turned out to be two hours uh, for the hundred and someone, hundred and something people who turned up. Uh, I didn't think there'd be many questions, so I ran it to about 50 minutes or so as a presentation, thinking, well, it leaves me about five or ten minutes at the end for questions. And the questions, of course, went on for another 45 minutes after that. But it was great fun. Uh, a bit weird, if I'm honest, because there was no video feed. Um, there was no visual at all except my presentation I could see on my screen and the microphone, which is a little bit more like recording a radio program than it was doing uh, a webinar. Because usually on a webinar, I get to at least see some people, I get some toing and froing, but this was just me making jokes. In fact, it was very much like recording a podcast. <laughs> it's just me with a microphone uh, and PowerPoint and hoping, hoping uh, that the the audience didn't suddenly diminish during the presentation. I actually could, you could see, it's a little bit unnerving when you do this. Uh, the platform they used was um, GoToMeeting, which is a great platform. It's a platform I used to use at Accenture a lot. And you can see how many people are on, have, have logged in. And of course, it's great at the beginning because the numbers are climbing. Uh, but towards the end, you start to see them wither away <laughs> obviously got to get a cup of tea or have some lunch and you just think oh dear what have I said it's, it's quite odd anyway the Photographer Academy well worth a look if you're into or looking for resources to learn from uh, been down the hearing dogs quite a bit some nice big shoots down there actually I started to put my new Z7 II through its paces um, the blog I am updating the blog talking about exactly what I'm doing with the camera um, not for any good reason except hopefully uh, it shows you the thought process, I guess, of a professional photographer taking on a new bit of kit. I don't know if that's useful to you or not, but I'm writing it up partly for me um, and partly as a reference for, for anybody else. But I always do this. I always will simply put a new camera or a new lens or a new set of strobes right into my workflow right on day one. Um, it may sound a little bit irresponsible, I guess, you know, testing new kit live with a client. Um, but I've been around I've been around the block a few times and I know I know when things are working and when they're not and I can correct it really quickly. I'll figure it out and put and also because I tend to run the camera in manual mode anyway then actually I've got total control right from the beginning. There's very little of the technology that's going to floor me. There's bits. Uh, certainly the photographing, uh, sorry, the focusing on the dog uh, part of it was uh, slightly entertaining. In fact, it, it, it only partly worked. I'm not quite sure what animals, the animal face detection has been trained on in Japan or with Japan's designers, but it certainly wasn't the hearing dogs that I was photographing. So it looks like I've got some fine tuning to do, uh, but some amazing pictures are coming off it. Uh, and that was with the hearing dogs down there next week. We've got two shoots doing puppies. I'm just photographing puppies next week. <laughs> so I'm sorry. I know some people have the best gigs, right? Uh, what else? Oh, there's admin going on this week. I've been changing mobile phone contracts. I'm one of those people that will put off updating a contract forever, basically. I'm the perfect customer because once 
once I'm in a contract, it's unlikely that I'm going to change that contract uh, for any period of time. Um, and anyway, I had to change mobile phone, phone contracts. It saved us about 50 quid a month, I think, which is just amazing uh, when you think about it. And it really didn't take me that long. But I'm panicking because when I dialed through all of the various accounts, there's no logic to it. I could not... Usually, if you, if you buy a car, right, or a computer or a camera, the price goes up the more features you get. That is simply not true when you looked through the contracts for uh, mobile phones. I mean, we got SIM-only contracts uh, because I've bought... Uh, we've bought the phones and they they will outlast the contracts anyway. So each of these are SIM deals. So really all I'm talking about, unless I've got something wrong, is data, voice, texts and bolt-ons. And yet there was no combination that I could figure out where it matched up to the amount you paid. <laughs> We're now paying less per contract for uh, Sarah, my wife and our son Jake than you are than I am for mine. And mine has less data and fewer features. Bizarre. I have no idea. I went through all of it. No idea. So anyway, got those sorted. Uh, British Gas threw us a little bit of a curveball. Uh, the heating blew up, which was exciting. I don't know if I've mentioned this in a previous podcast, but the heating blew up. Uh, it just stopped working. Great. Cold house. So I rang because we're insured uh, with British Gas's home care. Now, the home care, British Gas, if you're in the UK, British home care... British Gas Home Care has an ad where there's clearly a couple of lads or three lads living together in a house. Uh, heating blows up. A guy turns up later that day. That's the advert. And it says quite boldly, yes, we can fix that. Great. I've had the insurance for a long time. We rang them up. Boiler's broken. No hot water. To which they said, oh, we can send an engineer out in the next six weeks. You what? <laughs> You're kidding. Uh, luckily for me, a friend of ours, a really good, a really nice guy lives over the road as a plumber. Um, he came over. It turns out the pump had blown up. Uh, we ordered in a new one. He fitted it for me the very next morning. Of course, I've paid him. Of course, I've paid him. Um, and we're now going through the process of claiming that back from British Gas. But how is it OK that it's six weeks? Now, I know COVID's had an impact. Of course, it has. But I would have thought, given they have A, an advert running right now that says they'll be there same day, B, I pay quite a lot of money for the insurance, and C, I don't think their share price is being particularly affected by COVID. If anything, I would think energy energy usage has gone up. Certainly domestic energy usage has gone up. And I just think, like, here's the thing, right? With Amazon, their share price is through the roof. Now, love or hate Amazon, whatever else you think about them, um, they scaled up. They saw it coming, scaled up. And I know this because a friend of mine who runs a fireworks company uh, rents vans when he's going out and doing a display. And he checked in with the company he uses to get the vans. And he said they've got no vans because Amazon essentially have, have leased as many vans as they can lay their hands on. And all of the distributor, all their distributors have. So if it's okay and possible for Amazon rapidly to ramp up so that all of us can do our ordering online um, instead of going to the shops, surely someone at British Gas could have looked ahead and figured out you're going to need a few more engineers and got them trained up and uh, six weeks. And that, and that was for a broken boiler. Imagine if I just had, I don't know, a broken dishwasher, which is also covered under the insurance. What's that, six months? <laughs> so I'm now going through the process of moaning at them because I don't think it's right. Anyway, on to the Z7 or Z7, if you're my American friends. Uh, the Z7 Mark II, how am I getting on with that? Well, it's small. So I've ordered uh, the battery grip for it to bulk it back up again. <laughs> if I turn up at a wedding with this camera, people think I'm a hobbyist. It's also quite weird with my uh, 70 to 200 bolted on the front. Uh, imbalanced doesn't begin to describe it. So with a little bit of luck, um, that will uh, sort that out. Uh, so far, so good, actually. The thing is amazing. God knows how many menus they are. there are. I'm working my way through them. There are menus to configure menus. So there's a menu of options, for instance, for what you can uh, enable to play back. So when you hit the up and down button, which different displays of the same image, histogram, flashing highlights, etc. There's another menu that defines what you can select 
in that menu. And I've, I've discovered three or four of those at the moment where there's a menu of menus. I think they might have overdone it a little. Uh, it doesn't make things easier working my way through it. And it certainly doesn't really add to the use of the camera. I think that's one too many. Um, in the, when I used to write computer systems, we used to have these things whether you call them settings files or config files, I mean, we are going back a little bit, where what we would expose to the end user that they could configure their system, we'd have a series of tick boxes or lines that enable different things. Effectively, they've done that. They've exposed the config files and put them in a menu. Slightly weird. Um, versatile, yes, definitely, but probably, uh, probably unnecessary. Uh, one thing I have done is uh, sit with at least a couple of the lenses and calibrated them because I noticed pretty quickly that they weren't, it, it wasn't focusing exactly where it should. Now, back in the day when I first did this, I had a D100 and I had a plank with nails <laughs> driven into it, literally as a long plank with nails driven into it at about an inch apart. And then one of the nails was painted white. I would focus on the white nail and um, see which nail, when you looked at the picture, was actually in focus. So there's a difference between what I was seeing in the viewfinder, what appeared sharp when I took the picture, and what was actually sharp when I got the picture. You get this all the time. It's not unusual. Uh, and the same is still true even with mirrorless, even though it's going through an EVF. There are slight differences in... It sh I don't... I, theoretically, I can't see why that should be the case, but certainly true um, where it thinks it's focusing. Um, now, obviously, with my plank of nails, what I discovered was... I had a terrible technique. <laughs> it wasn't It wasn't at all what I thought it was. I was blaming the camera because every time I took a picture, I'd focus on my subject's eyes. And I love working wide open. Back then at f2.8, that was the lens I had. And their ears would be the bit that was sharpest. Focus on the eye, ear was sharp. Focus on the eye, ear was sharp. In the end, I started focusing on the tip of the nose and then the eyes would be closer. And what it was in the end, what I figured out was I just have bad technique. I've always used the center spot. Um, for those of you who are younger listening to the podcast, you won't remember this, but back in the day, we only had one focus spot. <laughs> it was in the middle, and that was that. You couldn't do a lot else. Um, and then as they started to add more and more zones that uh, were focusable, they were a different type of focusing spot, so they didn't work quite so well in low light. So I kept it in the middle, which was the crosshair. It was the one that had a configuration that would sort out focusing on pretty much anything. Whereas you moved out towards the edges of the frame, those focus spots weren't as effective, certainly not in low light. And I spent a lot of time working in low light. So I kept it in the middle. Now in digital, sorry, now in mirrorless, of course, every spot is exactly the same. There is no difference at all. But guess what? I still keep it in the middle because I'm just used to it. The problem was I'd use the middle spot, focus on the eye, and then to recompose the image because I really like faces being at the sides of the frame, I'd lean forward ever so slightly. Didn't even know I was doing it. It took me a lot of head scratching and a plank of nails to figure that out. Anyway, the first thing I've done, of course, with the camera is set up. Um, I use now, again, I'll put a link to this in the podcast notes. I use the Datacolor Spider Lens Cal. It's an expensive bit of kit for a bit of plastic. I'll give it that. Uh, you could, of course, make yourself a plank of nails. And basically what you do is you focus on the target and then when you look at the picture there's like a, gr a graded ruler that tells you where the focus actually ended up and surprise surprise actually i do have a couple of lenses that are off what the camera thinks is in focus and what's actually going on in the lens ever so slightly out so it's worth doing uh, so yeah that's the data color spider lens count if you're having any focusing troubles at all it's worth doing and obviously with a new camera and i'm matching it up so I've, I've bought the adapter, the, is it the FTZ? Is that what it is? I can't remember. Yeah, probably is called the FT, FTZ. I bet, that, I bet that's for F, F to Z series lenses. I bet that's what it means. Um, it bolts onto the front of the camera, and then I can stick any one of my existing uh, Nikon lenses on it. So I've got, so there's all sorts of little variables in there that clearly are going to make a difference. But one by one, I'm going through the lenses and calibrating them up, uh, which is quite nice. Uh, one thing about I have already learned about the Z7, Mark II is the video on it is great. So my D5, again, I explain I, I, the reason I didn't go to the D6 or haven't yet is essentially that's a sideways move. All right. I can see the future coming. Um, I know my D5 is 
retiring. Uh, thank you, uh, by the way, to someone who I won't give their name out on the podcast, but just one of the nicest guys in the world um, has uh, a D5 lying around. He bought a D6 as a D5 lying around and has said, if I want it, I can borrow it. What a kind thing. I love this industry. It's full of just the nicest people. Uh, I may yet to take him up on that particular offer. Uh, but at the moment, my D5 is coping anyway. It's just that it's ready for renewal. And the D6, six and a half thousand pounds worth of camera for a sideways move. And I can see the future. I know what's coming. Mirrorless and then eventually shutterless is coming. If Nikon are going to survive at all, the Z series of lenses or the Z series of lenses will be the future. So rather than dump six and a half thousand pounds into a camera that all I'm doing is sustaining our current uh, state of the world, that's why I've jumped to the Z7. Because although, strictly speaking, you can feel it, it's not a pro camera. But I felt the same way about the D800 when I had one of those as my prime. Um, and we actually, we actually used the D4 as a spare. Um, the D800, again, isn't a full pro camera. Little tiny details that make the life of someone who has a camera in their hands all day, every day, were missing. Uh, the big stuff was on the, on the, my D5, D4, is the displays on the back. Where there's the battery grip, there was a display on the back, and that was really, really useful. Things like all of the buttons lit up. So if I'm working in a really dark environment, I flick a switch and all of the buttons on the back light up. I know where they are anyway most of the time, but it's still a really useful feature. Of course, the Z7 has none of that. And the battery grip, although it will have shutter, uh, the shutter release and some joystick controls on it, it will miss having that little LCD or, yeah, it was an LCD back display that was so very, very useful. And yes, okay, I now have a permanent live view that has all this information on it. But there are two problems with that. One is that doesn't half dump the power out of your battery quickly. And the other is that if you're in a dark environment and I need to stay invisible and I do gigs like this, I didn't want the full screen glowing the whole time. And I haven't yet figured out, maybe there's a setting. Maybe there's a setting on the Z7 that allows me to put it into like a very dark mode where it just gives me a little bit of information. But I'm guessing not. I'm guessing I'm going to struggle with that. So uh, I could do it in the viewfinder, uh, I guess. But uh, there are little tiny things, the way the buttons are, the response times, and the power. The battery life is zero. I mean, I've, I'm used to the D5 where I can run for about two and a half thousand shots without thinking about changing the battery. This camera, 400. I'm going to need for a normal wedding where I take, let's say, two and a half thousand pictures, I'm going to need six fully charged batteries in my pocket, which is just ridiculous. I don't know. There are things about this that I'm going to find incredibly frustrating. But on the flip side of that, the immediacy of it is great. And to be able to see my histogram while I'm composing the shot, of course, hopefully will change my technique. I'm going to have to adapt and evolve and, you know, use the tools at my disposal. Uh, I know there are purists out there who will batter on about you shouldn't need a histogram. You should be able to read the meters, blah, 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 blah. But frankly, metering is a relatively new technique compared to the original cameras where you had no metering. You just had to know this stuff. Um, you had two settings, sunny and cloudy. <laughs> that was it. You know, everything changes and it changes for a reason. And when you're a pro, your job, your job is to create pictures. And I find the odd idiosyncrasies of the business where people are very purist. I find that slightly weird in a business context. Um, I've talked about this before. This was in the previous podcast. It doesn't matter how you do it. What matters is what you do with it. So I'm using all of the tools at my disposal and I'm hoping over time I'm going to grow to absolutely love having all of this data right in front of me. And I just read a pod, I read a blog yesterday that suggests Nikon are going to release uh, a new pro unit, a new pro mirrorless uh, sometime in the summer. So let's have a look. Let's hope that I've made the right decision in beginning that transition. And let's hope that when the pro, a fully pro equivalent to a D5 or D6 appears, that it is everything us Nikon shooters uh, would hope it's going to be. Uh, we'll just see. Anyway, uh, purpose of this, <laughs> most, of, most of this podcast is simply a catch up. Uh, but there is a purpose to it. And what I wanted to talk a little bit about is please stop being your own troll. Now, why do I say that? Well, because the voices in my head 
must be the same as the voices in many of yours. And I spend my life, I did this last night, we're, we're putting together an article for Professional Photo Magazine. A great magazine, by the way. Again, I'll put a link down below in the show notes uh, to send you across there. Uh, it's a fantastic magazine. It's, it's not specialist in portraits or specialist in manufacturer. It's just a professional photographer's magazine for people who either are already professional or who are transitioning it or just an aspirational magazine uh, for enthusiast photographers. But it's full of interesting articles. <laughs> Hopefully one of them will be mine. Uh, I've been writing with them now for uh, a couple of years, I think. Absolutely. I love the magazine. I love what it has in it. And I really like Terry Hope, who is the editor of and owner of the mag. Um, but I was sitting, and we, myself and Sarah were sitting going through the images that are candidates for the next article. So each of the articles, basically what I do is we show a picture and then we dissect it. We take it apart and talk about the shoot, talk about what the client was asking for, talk about how I ended up with that image and talk about the post-production and getting there. All of the camera settings, studio lights and things like that. So that you get a proper reverse engineering of an image. Um, it's something we've tried doing in a couple of different variations and it's working pretty well. But as we're going through the images, Sarah's flicking through our portfolio of stuff that she keeps aside. So she pulls images all the time and keeps them for portfolio work. And I must have shaken my head at so many. Oh, that's not good enough. No, that's no good. Oh, look at the faults in that. Oh, God, I'm not good enough. Oh, I'm no good. And eventually, I am becoming my own troll. I can feel it. Um, not in the sense that I'm going to type a load of hateful messages on my own Instagram feed. Not that. But in my head, I'm doing the same thing. I'm denigrating my work. I'm telling myself I'm not good enough. I'm beating myself over the fact that I can see flaws in the images. Of course, I can see flaws in the images. When did you last see an image that was flawless by any photographer? By you or by, you know, any one of the, the big names out there? Of course you don't. All images have flaws. All images have things that tomorrow you might do it slightly differently. And part of it is that's because you're changing. So we're looking through a portfolio that spans 15 years. And there are some of my favorite images in there, are actually old images. But my expanse of experience has changed. So the image I take tomorrow is never going to be the image I took yesterday. And consequently, my reaction to an image I've taken yesterday is not a consistent thing. Of course, I'm going to see faults. They're not really faults so much as things I wouldn't do again. Things that I've learned, tricks I've learned, stylistic differences in my tomorrow relative to my yesterday. Your history is important. And yet here I am. I'm not good enough. This picture's no good. Of course, that's what I'm doing. But I suggest you don't. Why do I say, I've said this a few times, why do I say at the end of every podcast, be kind to yourself? It's because I think typically creatives and in particular photographers are not. Don't be your own troll. There are plenty of people out there that are going to criticise your images. <laughs> the world is full of critics, amateurs, professionals, judges, you name it. Uh, you post, you stick your head over the parapet, be prepared for a brick to be thrown at it. That's just life. But you don't need to do it to yourself. You don't need to beat yourself up. Yes, you do need to be a self-critic. I've talked about this too. Of course, you need to look at your images as objectively as you can possibly manage. But at the end of the day, don't be a troll. The thing about photography, the thing about in particular portrait photography, is that it is a head game. It's all in your head. Think about it. Think about what's going on. You're bringing to that moment, you're bringing the relationship with the sitter, you're bringing your history, you're bringing your memories, you're bringing your experience, your ideas. And at the end of it, yeah, you might be bringing a little bit of technique. So all of that, if you think about it, all of that is in your head in one form or another. Yeah, you know, experience and you learn stuff, and there are one or two rules, but none of it is existential. All of it is inside your head. And if you're using that very same space in your head to beat yourself up, probably that's going to block your access to some of the other bits. There's, I've, 
I'm sorry, this podcast feels like I've said in it a lot. I said this, I've said, sorry, how am I wording this? Right. During this podcast, I've said a couple of times, I've talked about this before, and I think I have. And there's this lovely nugget. I remember it was a fortune cookie. I got probably a Chinese restaurant, I'm guessing, opened it up and it said, what would you do tomorrow if you knew you couldn't fail? Now, an extension of that is how creative do you think you'd be tomorrow if you didn't critique quite so hard? If you didn't block your ideas with inhibitions and basically fear and insecurity. And I've, I'm one of those photographers who is dreadfully insecure. It might not come across because with the podcast and Mastering Portrait Photography and the awards and everything else, I am not one of those supremely confident photographers. I'm a confident individual. I can stand on a stage in front of a thousand people and not be, not. it doesn't mess with my head at all. I'm really very happy out there. But when you ask me about my images, I spend my entire life just like all of us. But when you ask me about my images, just like all of us, I spend my time worrying that I'm not good enough. Of course I do. I'm like everyone else. And I'm suggesting that's a very bad use of my own headspace. So stop being your own troll. Just make sure you're not wrecking the very thing that makes all of this possible. And there you go. There's my profound message uh, at the end of this podcast. I uh, hope it's useful. If not, hope it was entertaining. If not, switch off. <laughs> you don't have to listen to it. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for all the emails I get in. Uh, please do continue to send them in. I try to email back. I try to email to everybody as quickly as I can. Uh, Paul at paulwilkinsonphotography.co.uk. That's Paul at paulwilkinsonphotography.co.uk if you want to get hold of me. Uh, for more tips, tricks, and for obviously those image critiques that we've been running, head over to masteringportraitphotography.com, which is also the home of this podcast. If you would like to subscribe to the podcast, uh, most platforms allow subscription. Hit that uh, tell me or remind me or subscribe button. And then as if by magic, it will appear in your in-tray every time I publish an episode. Uh, if you have any ideas for the podcast, uh, drop them in an email. Uh, if you'd like me to shut up, well, <laughs> I'm going to ignore that. Uh, until then, I hope you're staying safe. Uh, my mum has her vaccine injection today. So to all of you out there who are in the process of making uh, the world a safer place by getting your vaccines good on you, uh, let's hope that in the next few months we start to transition out of this dreadful pandemic and into the brave new future that surely must lie ahead until then whatever else stop being a troll be kind to yourself take care guys 